I'd like to welcome everybody to the Spring RE Research Extension Center Conference. And then right now we're doing the Research Extension Center Crash Course, which is a 10 minute summary of each REC from across the state. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started and try and stay on schedule as we are recording it, but we do have 20 minutes to half an hour at the end for discussion and questions. And if you're a new faculty member uh, and wanted to say a comment uh, of who you are and, and what program you're working in, that'd be great. We're gonna save that to the end so we can stay on schedule. Our first presenter today is Dr. Kevin Sedovic from the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. Kevin, the floor is yours. Well, thanks, Krishna. I sure appreciate you coming on this afternoon and giving us a chance to show your kind of our showcase of our research stations. And so put together about a 10 slide PowerPoint to see, show, you, show what we have to offer and kind of what our model is and what we're shooting for in terms of research and extension programming. I'm currently the director for the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. I've been there since 2016 as the interim director. I'm also a faculty and extension specialist located here on the main station campus in Fargo. You know, and our goal at the research station is really to address the citizens of North Dakota in doing research and extension programming that enhances the lives while improving ecosystem services and conservation of our grasslands. We are a grassland station and our focus is grassland management as it relates to livestock production and ecosystem services. Uh, we try to achieve these goals through collaborative research with the main station scientists and other REC directors through integrated research programs. You know, when we look at benefits and disadvantages of collaboration, and I wanted to put this as a starting point because there's obviously benefits and there's gonna obviously be some, some disadvantages. And so the benefits we look at, we provide more opportunities to conduct new and innovative research. And we get a better opportunity to increase training of graduate students. These are the future leaders of our industry and our land managers. Uh, they reduce the costs for labor per project and for us, it requires less scientists to be hired at the research station. We can use those scientists that are on the stations or at the main station as collaboration scientists versus hiring new scientists. And it, it increases the efficiency of our land and animals. We can do more with more people on our, with, with our available resources. We talked about setup providing land and animals. Uh, it puts big, greater stress and demand on our permanent staff and facilities. Um, in, in many cases, been on the research trial, we need to invest in new infrastructure or temporary housing. In our case, it's fencing, water, laboratory, cattle handling equipment. Um, we do provide summer seasonals and graduate students. When we get into to collaborative projects, there are certain grants that can actually hire some of the seasonals as well. Um, we provide partial or total funding for some graduate students and seasonal employees. And what we find through time is that a lot of the grants that we can achieve then can provide the funding for these grad students. And the other negative is with reduced scientists, we see potential for adding income from grants is reduced. And, and the caveat to that is if you, if you have a great collaborative team with other RECs or main station scientists, they become part of your writers on these grants to support the projects with, with other grants. So this is a map, does this show up fine, Chris? Yes. All right, so this is a map of the grassland station and it's about 5,300 contiguous acres we're about two thirds grasslands, one third tillable acres. So you can see in the, the, all these dark black lines are basically fences for infrastructure that we have in place in terms of grazing strategies. Uh, the red lines is our tillable acres, whether it's used for crop, crop ground or forage production to support the herd. And in many cases, we can also do research trials uh, on these, these same lands that look at maybe integrated livestock and cropping systems. Down the bottom here is our main uh, the office, as well as our livestock facilities. Um, and we'll kind of go through these individually. So we, we have about 5,300 acres, of which 3,300 acres is native range pasture land. We have just under 2,000 acres of tillable land and about 120 acres of wetlands. We run about a 450 brood cow herd with 25 mature bulls. So we have about 200 plus yearling heifers, 200 steers, 35 to 70 cull cows, depending on the year, and 10 cannulated heifers. This is a fairly large herd that provides opportunity to do large scale research on the resources, as well as looking at individual uh, other trials with livestock trials that we can look at reproduction or nutrition. My rule of thumb on the research station that every, is that every animal on the station has to do at least two projects uh, just to make it more efficient. 
We support range research, pasture, livestock, forages, soils, wildlife, pollinators, and precision ag research and extension programming. The facilities that we have on the place, the headquarters is the, is the headquarter building with office space and a computer cluster. We have Wi-Fi throughout the center, um, including in our temporary our housing. We have a new range and forage laboratory. We have a livestock working facility and a pen system. We wanna do any pen type of research for livestock. Uh, most of the pen type of research though is either done at Carrington or at the main station in Fargo. We do have a forage agronomy plots in place and we have cropland for cover crop and late season grazing opportunities. We have housing units available for 22 people, whether it's seasonals or grad students. And we have a great local community uh, that people can, can enjoy. We are really in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we're about 10 miles from the, small, from the local community of Streeter. We're about an hour, hour and 10 from Bismarck and about 45 minutes from Jamestown. It's beautiful country. If you're familiar with the Prairie Pottle region, it is the kind of the, the, the main center for, the, for our duck factory of the lower 48. So it is a beautiful area to enjoy. We do have 11 full-time staff and two part-time staff. We have two scientists, a livestock scientist and a range scientist. We have two research specialists, a range specialist and a forage specialist. Our herdsman and a herdsman has two livestock technicians to help with the research projects as well as managing the, the livestock herd. We have one agronomy technician which helps with the farming operation as well as our agronomy plots. And we have one range technician that helps with the range uh, research trials. We have two extension state specialists, one's livestock and one's range. And we have one administrative assistant which does everything, accounting, payroll, time slips, cooks the food. Um, she really does everything. And this is Sandy here in the picture to, uh, to the right. Um, we were fortunate to have someone that can do, do a lot of stuff for one, one person. Of course, you have the director and we usually hire about 10 to 14 summer seasonals to help with the research projects. I think last year we had 13 seasonals uh, for our projects. We do support, and, and I'm a big I'm a proponent of the graduate student model. You know, for example, going, if you look at February, 2021, we currently have 15 graduate students that are working collaboratively with other scientists or RECs um, on the station. We have eight in range science. We have two in animal science. Um, of the eight in range, we have three PhDs and five master students. In animal science, we have one PhD and one master's. The caveat here is we do fund, the grass Station does fund three of these range uh, students and we, we fund one animal science student. We also have five other students that are working under grants, two in NRM, one in precision ag, one in plant sciences and one in microbiology. And the point of this slide is really to show you the diversity that we can work with in terms of providing opportunity for scientists at the station is just not range. We really cover a lot of different topics that fit the natural resources. So the opportunity to do research and a number of different questions and arenas is available. Uh, with, a, with a graduate student model, you know, our goal is to get these graduate students out. We have uh, had 10 grad students finish up their programs in the last four years, four in range, five in animal science and one in soils. And of course, the goal of these, of these students as well as faculty is to get peer reviewed publications. Um, this enhances promotion. So we work, everything we do has to be able to be publishable. We've done 28 peer reviewed publications in the last four years. I'm a big proponent of research reports. Not everybody looks at research reports, but I think it's a great avenue to get the story out to our local constituents, as well as our legislators. And it's a great opportunity for graduate students to write. Um, and we've also put out a couple uh, extension publications. So to summarize, what we're looking for is we want collaborators that address the critical questions that meet the need of our North Dakota citizens. And the RECs are a great opportunity to collect pre-data, uh, which leads to higher success in securing extramural funds uh, Predata is a great way to get some, some information for over a one or two year period. And then the grants, the, the funds, the opportunities to get grants really goes up high. Uh, we, we ask our, anyone to come out to the station and respect our staff, our students, and, and our community. And we do the same for them. And you need to enjoy the outdoors. If you're going to come to Streeter, we really want you to enjoy the outdoors. It's a beautiful venue. Um, the, out, the opportunity to, to just enjoy the outdoors is there. All projects need to be appropriately designed with replication so they're publishable. And when we ask scientists to come out, no matter where you're from, we expect them when we ask them to hold their weight. Um, I don't expect my staff to do all the work. And so it's just, it's, it's a team approach. And I look at a team approach uh, with the main station and other RECs. 
We do prefer the graduate student model, and we expect the research to be published in peer-reviewed articles, research reports, and extension circulars where appropriate. I'm sure my time is up. I do want to thank you for the time, and I'll, I'll stay on as I can. This is our contact information. This is my cell phone if you have any questions or want to visit, and this is our address from the Grassland Station uh, as well as available. Our next uh, research extension center is the Dickinson REC with Dr. Chris Augustine giving the presentation and the floor is yours and you can share. So I'm director of the Dickinson Research Extension Center. Uh, I have been around here for about 11 months now. So I'm, I'm pretty new to this um, to, to, to be in here. But uh, yeah, I'll share with you guys uh, some of the things that we have going on and uh, what opportunities uh, you might see of the Dickinson Research Center. So with, with the DREC, uh, we have over 8,000 acres uh, for a land base. Um, it's a mixture of uh, grazing land, uh, forage, uh, we do livestock research and also agronomic research. Uh, 6,200 of those acres are owned, uh, 1,900 of which are rented. And so on this map here, uh, where my cursor is right at Dickinson, that's where our main uh, headquarters are. And down to the southwest is Pyramid Park. Uh, that is right in the Badlands. Uh, just to the northwest of uh, our main office is our Northwest 23, where we have a mixture of agronomy, as well as uh, haylands and a little bit of range. Up to the north here is where uh, our ranch headquarters are, uh, located near Manning. That's about a 25 minute drive uh, north of Dickinson. Uh, over here to the east a little bit, that little L-shaped parcel, that is the 4-H Land Trust. Um, down uh, to the south and east is our Bain Research Farm. And then uh, over here by Richardson is uh, where we have uh, some grazing lands that uh, uh, the name of that parcel is, is escaped my mind right now. I know I got it listed uh, coming up. But here's a little bit closer map of uh, where these areas are. So we have a whole bunch of, of land available to do uh, research on and we are kind of spread out. So up in the top left quadrant is uh, uh, zoomed in on that Manning Ranch headquarters. Up there we have, uh, currently we have about 790 head of cattle, uh, 385 uh, cows, uh, I think 200 are backgrounded, uh, about 150 replacement heifers. And then we also have some feedlot um, uh, facilities there. Um, so up there is a mixture of rangeland, uh, for uh, hayland, and then we do have uh, fields that uh, would be available for some uh, agronomy work. Um, down south, uh, or I guess uh, below that one in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, that is uh, aerial photo of Pyramid Park. Like I said, that is right in uh, the Badlands. And then this uh, parcel to the on the right-hand side, that is our main office, which we're just off of interstate. Um, and that's mostly cropland uh, in, in that area. And then on our next uh, slide, here's uh, the Bain Research Farm. So that was south and east of Richardson. And then the Schnell Recreation Area was that, uh, that, that area just to the east of Richardson. And this is mostly grazing land. Uh, and with that, we have a relationship with, um, uh, I believe it's the, uh, the Bureau of Land Management, uh, where we can do grazing work on. One of the things that, that we have at the, the main office is we have a large horticulture area. My, my predecessors um, were very proactive in developing some horticulture stuff. And so we have uh, a lot of trees available, uh, as well as perennial plants. Uh, I'll show you that in a little bit. But here's a zoomed in area of some of the things that we have going on where we have organic plots. We have over uh, 10 acres of certified uh, um, organic uh, crop land. And then we have an area here for conventional plots. Most of our area is no-till. And one of the things that we're working on is a virtual um, ar arboretum or, or horticulture project where we'd like to have the general public be able to come in and um, use QR codes with their smartphones and being taken to, to specific uh, trees of interest. And this is kind of what we have going on with that. It's a Google map that uh, John Stick, our GIS person, uh, developed. And we are in the process of cataloging uh, all the different uh, trees and uh, 
um, ornamentals that are grown here. I believe we have over 150 varieties uh, or species of trees. So for some of our infrastructure, we have a large classroom at our main office, and this is the main office uh, in, in the picture where we can house about 45 people for a, a workshop. Uh, we do have three other smaller conference rooms. We have had some issues with acoustics in the past being echoey and uh, a heating system that uh, is terrible for, for uh, trying to have some of this uh, transformational education going on. And that stuff has been addressed and is much better. Uh, up at the ranch headquarters at Chanel, we have a small conference room where we can fit about 30 people and we do have smart boards up there and that's so if you're looking for uh, workshops, uh, we, we do have uh, facilities up there that can house that. Uh, we do have housing for seasonal staff, researchers, as well as graduate students. I think we can house about 15 people. Uh, most of our agronomy is uh, long-term no-till. And like I said, we have a little bit over 10 acres of uh, certified organic uh, land here as well. So for our staff, a uh, handful of uh, the, the different leaders that we have here, uh, one is Gary Otmar, he's our ranch manager uh, up at the Manning Ranch. Uh, Doug Landblum is our animal scientist, Lee Mansky is our range scientist, Glenn Martin is our agronomy technician, and Ryan Beto is our cropping systems extension specialist. Uh, and being that there are some faculty people on here, we are looking for summer students for livestock uh, and agronomy. So if you know somebody that's looking for a summer job, uh, please send them our way. So that's a quick rundown uh, of our facilities. Thank you. Is there any quick questions uh, for Dr. Augustine? I have a quick question uh, if I could ask. Um, so you mentioned about the organic plots you have at your uh, facility. I was wondering what, how old are these organic plots and, and what kind of treatments you have going in there? Sure, so uh, historically uh, we had a research agronomist who did a lot of um, uh, organic research. That person left uh, a few years ago and honestly not much has gone out there. It's been alfalfa uh, for four or more years. Some of our certified organic land, I believe is 10 or 15 years organic. Uh, some of it is, it just came up and is now certified. Uh, so some of the things that, that I'm looking at, uh, in, in, that I'm interested in is looking at the microbiome of the organic versus the conventional uh, thing, which I, I assume that's kind of what you were, you're curious about. I've had some conversations with Dr. Gash in the soils department uh, about that. And, and right now, um, all that we'll be doing with organic research is just variety trials. Um, for, the, for the next few years until w what I've been informed with trying to develop an organic program, you really, first thing you need to have a certified land, which we have, but then you also need to develop some sort of resume. And so with the variety trials, we're hoping to do that. Maybe down the road, there's the right pro program and I can get a postdoc or, you know, a soft funded position, something like that is, is what I'm hoping for. But we'll, we'll see what happens. Well, thank you, Dr. Augustine. Um, and thank you for the question. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next research extension center, uh, Jerry Bergman up at Williston. And you have been share, you can share your screen if you would like. The Williston Research Extension Center was actually started in 1907 as an irrigated station. And then in 1954, it was uh, moved from the, where now Williston State College is out four miles. Uh, west of Williston on an 800 acre um, farm, which is shown in the picture on your right. Um, this is where most of our dry land research is done. Uh, in 2001, we did purchase 160 acres, 23 miles northeast of Williston, Nation Valley, where our irrigation research and development project was established and is ongoing. Um, most of the information on all our research is updated each year on our website on the ag research uh, update of, for this year would be uh, 2020. It will list all our staff and all of the research that they're doing. Uh, this study is done in cooperation with the MSU Eastern Ag Research Center uh, that also has these results there. 
Uh, this is some of the work that Dr. Godin Prodham is doing. Uh, he's doing a soybean planting date study and a flax seeding date and rate study. Uh, he's using drone uh, on all of his studies and these are pictures uh, taken from his drone. Uh, he's also uh, looking at using drone to collect agronomic data on all our variety trials and also uh, studying the optimum irrigation uh, amount and timing for soybeans uh, with Tyler, and then also doing a derm seeding date and rate study, not only to get optimum yield, but also to get low grain cadmium, which is an issue uh, in some of our fields out west. Uh, the next program that we have is the pathology program run by Dr. Kalisle. Uh, she works on these four crops, pulse crops, sugar beets, derm, and canola. Also shown on this slide is uh, Tahini, her research specialist, and Ivana, her research technician. She does have quite a bit of summer help in addition uh, to this staff. Uh, her approach is threefold. One is crop rotation, where she'll study uh, root rot, uh, soil health and nodulation, a fungicide uh, aspect where she works with uh, chickpeas and derm uh, principally, and then genetic resistance uh, studies on field peas, chickpeas, and fusarium resistance in derm variety. Uh, our dryland variety trials, uh, we do test uh, varieties on about 15 different crops. Uh, this is a major effort that's done with the NDSU breeders, uh, Montana State, uh, private companies, and even other uh, countries that submit varieties for testing. Another part of this is uh, they collaborate with the seed increase program and North Dakota Crop Improvement in getting the new and improved varieties uh, produced to get out to our producers. Jim Streak is our soil scientist and these are showing the projects he works on. Uh, one is soil surface acidification, uh, no-till, uh, high-end rates of pH drops and so he's studying uh, remedies on how to uh, treat uh, low pH uh, under no-till. Also, he's doing work on saline seep reclamation, a lot of work on crop water use as influenced by uh, crop sequence. Uh, he's also working with Godam uh, using uh, water use measurements on soybeans, flax, and also a pipeline reclamation project where we had a 36 inch pipeline come across our dryland site and uh, they're doing studies on the best way to reclaim that soil back to normal productivity. The irrigation project Jim's working on is the optimal irrigation for uh, the different irrigated crops as well as the effective tillage, no-till and conventional till on water use in a corn, soybean, barley rotation. Uh, Tyler uh, Sheldy is agronomist that is managing the Nation Valley Irrigation Project. Uh, he has two research specialists, Justin Jacobs and Andrina Turnquist. Uh, again, this was started in 2001 and it's a uh, really uh, gain uh, interest by our irrigated growers uh, in all the aspects of uh, crop production, uh, irrigation management, water use studies, uh, and IPM. So um, I think as this moves forward, uh, there'll be more work on variable rate irrigation. This is some of the 2020 projects that Tyler listed. Again, a lot on management, water use, uh, crop rotations, disease studies, uh, 
comparing water sources from the lake and from groundwater uh, variety trials. And he does uh, help Kyle drags this on foundation seed increase of some uh, varieties of foundation seed. A horticultural program uh, right now, uh, we have a vacant position there, but uh, we are carrying out the All-American Selection Display Garden and a HASTAP trial that was established in 2017. And we'll continue to evaluate that with uh, uh, seasonal workers that we have. Uh, this shows a, a new study we're going to be doing on strawberries. Uh, comparing high tunnel, low tunnel, and open field. And this is done in crop cooperation with the NDSU Horticultural Program. Uh, Claire Keen is our extension cropping specialist. And this shows some of the highlights that she's working on. Uh, one of her main objectives is training county agents, but she also is the lead uh, extension person on organic certification and production support. Her research is being done on Kernza and intercropping, and she also is doing on-farm demonstrations on pipeline reclamation and the Kernza uh, new crop that's a perennial green. One of the important aspects of our center's foundation seed program, the building shown here on the right is our new foundation seed plant. Uh, currently the millwright and the electricians are starting to install the seed cleaning line and we expect this to be up and running in, in June. Uh, this last year, uh, Kyle Dregs has uh, produced uh, 24 different varieties of 11 different crops. And uh, he also has leased additional crop acres for pure seed production. This plant will produce or uh, process uh, about 200 bushel per hour compared to our old plant of 35 bushel per hour. That kind of covers uh, what I had to present and uh, would welcome any potential collaboration with other scientists uh, from NDSU and other centers. Thank you, Jerry. We're going to move right into our next presenter, which is Brian Jenks from the North Central Research Extension Center. And you can share, Brian. My name is Brian Jenks, weed scientist with NDSU here in Minot. Um, we have I have shown here three pictures of our facilities. We focus on mostly agronomy, plant breeding, weed science and entomology. We previously had emphasis also on uh, soil science, uh, livestock, and one other one. Uh, but I, anyway, because of budget constraints, we no longer have individuals in those positions, but hopefully that will change in the future. So here is our, our main office building. We have a, a large meeting room for grower meetings, a couple of smaller meeting rooms for uh, smaller meetings. Down the bottom left here is the seed increase program facilities. This larger building right here is the new seed cleaning facility, which is uh, just uh, getting up and running. And uh, this is our agronomy research lab in the bottom right, where we have a few dry labs and a wet lab, and uh, which is then also connected to our greenhouse. As far as individuals, of course, Shana Forster is our director, and uh, we have two uh, individuals uh, to help us for administrative and secretarial uh, positions. Our foundation seed increase program is currently being manned by Andrew Birch. Unfortunately, he's the uh, lone man carrying the load here. We've had a couple of other individuals who took other positions uh, recently. And there's a, uh, about 1,400 acres 
uh, that are dedicated to the foundation seed increase program that you either owned or leased. And my understanding is uh, we're speaking in part here to individuals who are new faculty and maybe you're not familiar with what the foundation seed increase program is. Basically the mission is to provide producers with diverse crops and varieties that are well adapted to the region. And then these varieties are made available through county crop and ag improvement associations. The crops and varieties that will be available for the 2021 season would, would be barley, durum, flax, spring wheat, oat, peas, and soybeans. These are the crops that we work with. Other research centers may have different crops. Eric Eriksmoen directs the agronomy research. Eric is the research agronomist. He has Austin and, and Darby working with him. They focus on various cropping systems and production studies with uh, many seed company variety trials and breeder nurseries. They focus a lot on cereal grains, barley, durum, spring wheat, et cetera. Uh, many broadleaf crops, canola, sunflower, soybean, dry bean, safflower, and more. And then many new or alternative crops that are evaluated for their agronomic traits. Uh, Eric does a lot of research in many different areas. Uh, this is just a very brief summary of some. He conducts some no-till versus conventional tillage uh, studies evaluating barley, durum, spring wheat, and oat, uh, soil fertility studies, and then in various crops. And then also they have at least three off-station research sites to uh, evaluate um, many crops throughout North Central North Dakota. These are uh, a lit, this is a list of many of the crops that have been studied or evaluated here in Minot, this is not an all-inclusive list. Obviously you see on the left, many uh, small grain crops, uh, many oil seed crops, and also many uh, legume crops and, and others. Now all of these are not studied every year, but these are some that have been studied over the past and a large focus for Eric now is the uh, hemp. Anna Worrell is our pulse crop breeder. She focuses on dry peas, chickpeas, and lentil. She works uh, in the field season, obviously designing, planning, and planting and managing uh, studies. And then in the winter, very busy processing in, uh, seeds and analyzing data and getting ready for meetings and preparing publications in the winter. The pulse crop program has a two-pronged approach with the uh, main campus as well as here in Minot. So on the main campus the focus is primarily on discovery and evaluation of new germplasm with rapid hybridization to create superior progenies. Most of the work is done in a greenhouse and lab environment. And then in Minot, the focus is mostly on evaluating advanced breeding lines. And then uh, Minot is also the location where graduate students and postdocs can focus on some of their field work. For our extension education, uh, Travis Peraska is our entomologist. He's very busy in many areas, which I'll cover in a minute. We have three positions that are not currently field, filled. Our extension agronomist, this position is filled, but not filled. Uh, that's because the individual who accepted the position is stuck in Brazil and due to visa issues ha has not been able to join us yet, but hopefully he will soon. And then also we have uh, two vacant positions that maybe will be filled down the road in soil health and livestock. So Travis uh, works in extension education, focusing mostly on entomology, 
works a lot with agents, growers, horticulturists, and 4-H. Uh, works on educating in many uh, very important areas, such as an IPM crop survey of soybean, sunflower, wheat, and barley, um, where they, he shows ID of plant disease and insect damage and re, uh, recording of incidents. And then publishing those results in a crop and pest report, as well as other areas. And also uh, crop surveys of wheat, midge, sunflower, canola, and he conducts research on other topics as well. He has a large focus on horticulture with various topics of interest to gardeners and uh, those interested in landscaping. Proper use of pesticides, establishment, development of bee hotels, and conservation of pollinators and beneficial insects. He does a lot of work with 4-H and insect education, as well as serving as a judge on a county and state level. For grape research, Chris Osmondson covers this area. She has uh, evaluated over 5,000 vines since 2013. These include crosses of hardy wild vines and quality wine cultivars. And they select the top accessions for further study. As for 2020 research, more than 1,000 inferior lines have been removed. Fruit data has been gathered from 1,200 plants, production of 72 white wines and 167 166 red wines. And then the scoring by industry leaders revealed six silver and 28 bronze category wines. And then four accessions were selected for further study. For weed science, uh, I am joined by Tiffany Walter, Gary Wilby, and Dana Pisick. We have conducted weed control studies in about 26 different crops. Uh, over the time that I've been here, usually we're focusing on probably eight to 10 study, eight to 10 crops each year. We focus on how to control challenging weeds. Uh, most farmers use herbicides to control weeds and therefore we put a lot of time into helping them uh, have access to more products and know how to use them to reduce input costs. We do research to provide data for registration of new products, uh, to update labels of existing products, and then how to manage weed resistance. Some of the weeds that we focus on, kochia, wild buckwheat, uh, winter annuals, nearleaf hawks, beard, horseweed, and then grasses, green foxtail, and wild oat. Here's an example of one of the issues we're dealing with, with uh, resistance, uh, herbicide resistance. Here's our susceptible population. Here is a farmer sample where the herbicides are not controlling the wild oat. Also, kochia is a big weed for us. We're trying to learn how to control kochia uh, better in a burn down. Here, glyphosate is not controlling the kochia but another treatment that we evaluated Authority MTZ did control the kochia. Other weeds of interest, this is narrowleaf hawksbeard, a weed that's shown up in the western part of the state. This is actually a soybean field, but it looks like a hawksbeard field. And then horseweed is another big problem for us in the west and, and actually across the whole state. Palmer amaranth and, and water hemp uh, are not in this area yet. Uh, but we're, we're trying to, uh, I, I have been part of the team that has tried to uh, manage the Palmer amaranth that has shown up in the state. And then, uh, you know, these two weeds are, are weeds that we do not want in the western part of the state. You guys can keep these in the east uh, and we'll be happy. That's all I have. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Brian. Our next uh, research extension center to be highlighted would be the Carrington Research Extension Center. Mike Osley, uh, the agronomist at Carrington, is giving the presentation, and the floor is yours. You can share. 
thank you for uh, uh, giving me the time here. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of fun to see what everybody else is uh, doing. It's kind of a reminder. Um, um, so uh, yes, I'm presenting on behalf of the Carrington Research Extension Center. Uh, we're about two hours uh, out of Fargo to the northwest, uh, kind of in this uh, transition area between the eastern versus uh, western climate in the state. Uh, um, and uh, we have a uh, number of pretty, pretty robust program uh, lineup out here at Carrington. I'm uh, just going to show this little video we had uh, this last summer. We uh, planted this nice little uh, canola soybean plot and as a way to uh, welcome people back last summer after COVID was supposed to be over. Um, <laughs> so I guess uh, we'll see what happens this year. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, as you can see uh, uh, here, we're looking over uh, one of our uh, pivot center pivot fields. So we have both dry land and irrigated agriculture in Carrington. Uh, Probably, I mean, certainly uh, dryland is a large bit of that focus. It's uh, maybe 25 or 30% of what we do is uh, irrigated agriculture. Uh, in total, there's around uh, 2,000 acres, uh, the majority of which are uh, rented every year. Uh, so we're pretty reliant on the uh, surrounding area uh, to maintain uh, our productivity, especially on the uh, foundation seed stocks into things. Uh, so I put together uh, just this uh, 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 kind of flow chart here to um, help better, better understand uh, some of the programmatic areas we have out of Carrington. Uh, we kind of start out with the uh, uh, three main uh, functions uh, that happen at, it can happen at an REC. Uh, we have the, uh, uh, the crops research, animal research, and foundation seed stocks. Uh, all three components have been uh, pretty successful uh, currently and in the past in um, carrying out our mission. Uh, the uh, uh, crop science uh, side is broken out into uh, uh, four uh, scientist positions. Uh, so we have there uh, uh, Dr. Michael Wunsch in plant pathology, uh, Dr. Jasper Thibault in soil science, um, myself uh, in agronomy. And then uh, as you heard earlier, we have Dr. David Kramer in our precision ag program. Uh, but we also have uh, several other areas uh, of more intense focus, uh, which include the, our fruit project, uh, which is managed by Kathy Wiederholt uh, and uh, Steve Zwinger is managing uh, our uh, organic research uh, program. And then we also uh, have the uh, Oaks Irrigation Research Site, uh, which is managed by uh, Kelly Cooper, uh, located in Oaks, North Dakota. Uh, so it's quite a uh, diversity of um, uh, research uh, projects, research types uh, that are occurring out here uh, on an annual basis. Um, I guess I'll move on. So just to uh, uh, go a little bit further into some of what we're doing, uh, we are uh, really happy with the uh, uh, new lab facility that we have uh, and the greenhouse that's attached to it. So we've been able to take pretty good advantage of the, the facilities thus far. And uh, we're still just kind of tapping into that potential right now. And uh, there's a lot of new areas that I think we're gonna be able to move into. Uh, research-wise with those facilities uh, that are really going to help uh, uh, help out uh, in, with us uh, uh, serving our mission. Uh, we have a pretty robust uh, livestock feedlot facilities as well. Uh, we have uh, some capacity for uh, livestock research beyond the feedlot, but I'd, I'd say that's certainly uh, the largest strength uh, and again, we were uh, another recipient of a new seed cleaning plant from the legislature uh, with our seed stocks program, uh, which again was uh, really, really uh, needed uh, on that side and uh, has made uh, working conditions uh, tremendously better uh, for that group and as well as enhancing the capacity. 
and we certainly do have conference and meetings meeting rooms uh, available for uh, internal and external use um, at Carrington. So some of the other things to to note here is that uh, uh, we end up doing uh, quite a lot of collaboration out here as, as well. And part of the reason is because it's a relatively short distance from campus. Uh, so uh, uh, we have uh, really strong collaborations with almost all the plant breeders and then uh, other uh, researchers from campus that uh, work out here on an annual basis. So, uh, you know, in many cases, we have really good uh, resources to uh, help set up field trials for success. And, uh, you know, we ins will invite uh, collaborators to come out and um, with any kind of involvement, whether they want to, uh, whether we're just providing the space or providing additional uh, resources beyond that. Uh, we have uh, quite a range of environments that we work with. Uh, so again, we have both the dry land and irrigated, as well as till and no-till uh, conditions. And, and then again, uh, the organic research uh, out here. And then because we have these different components, there are have been opportunities we've been trying to foster that uh, involve um, more integrated crop livestock opportunities. Someone asked uh, uh, a couple months ago <laughs> what it is that the focus is for the uh, uh, agronomic research out here. And it actually took me a little while to respond, uh, but kind of what I came up with was uh, uh, what we're focused on is uh, land use efficiency and crop quality. So the uh, if you were to put an umbrella over a lot of the work that myself and the others are doing, uh, most of it falls within that, uh, within one of those categories. So, uh, and again, right now, our research is primarily uh, field-based practical research. Uh, and uh, with that, we have uh, a pretty good lineup of equipment options for doing a lot of different uh, uh, tasks, some of them. Uh, some kind of odd pieces of equipment here and there that uh, don't exist a lot of other places. I can't vouch that all of it's in uh, uh, tip top shape, but uh, uh, like anyone else, we're always trying to improve what we have uh, and what we have the ability to do. Uh, and again, uh, like myself, a lot of the other researchers out here have pretty broad interests and are, are willing to facilitate uh, whatever opportunities uh, are avail. So, and then of course, uh, because of our location, um, you know, we have a pretty good exposure to uh, the constituents around us for both the outreach side and also uh, the feedback side uh, from farmers and, and uh, other agribusinessmen in the area. So um, with that, uh, if anybody is interested, uh, I can certainly facilitate other communications too. If people want to uh, contact me, I can point them in the right direction for uh, some different collaborators um, uh, for whatever projects people might have in mind. So I think that's really all I have to share. So thank you, Mike. Uh, our next research extension center that we're highlighting is Langdon. Uh, Brian Hansen, the agronomist, is giving the presentation, and you should be able to share, and the floor is yours, Brian. Yeah, I'm Brian Hansen. I'm the Langdon <coughs> Research Agronomist, and Randy Melhoff is our, our director here. And the picture you see there is our uh, office building where we have a conference room, holds, holds about 125 people, and we have a smaller conference room, and where some of the staff are located. Now, Langdon is uh, kind of tucked in the northeast part of the state, and you generally consider this region to be some of the cooler um, temperatures in the state, um, especially along these counties along here. I have the shortest growing season and cooler temperatures. We do have the Red River Valley along here, which is a, a fair amount of difference, even though it's close compared to uh, where Langdon is located. And we're about 180 miles from the main campus and about 17 miles from the Canadian border. Now, this aerial view of the the station is um, back in 2014, so it's been a little while. Um, this is our office building off to the 
lower corner here, and that was built in 2004. And, um, <clears throat> and off, off to the right there, we have a new agronomy lab that was built in uh, 2014. And, uh, and before we were housed over in this area, so it was a tremendous upgrade when we got that. Our plant pathologist would like to see a greenhouse here sooner or later to help his work. And Langdon Research Station was established in 1909. And when it was first um, started, for many years, we were located what they call the Durham Triangle. And of course, Durham has moved further west yet with uh, some of the diseases we've had in our area. So that is not a focus at the time, but it's still um, an area where uh, a lot of companies or uh, breeders come out to this area. We generally have, like I said, the shortest growing season, but you also have fair amount of diseases up in this area. So um, <clears throat> the plant pathologist uh, keeps busy with that. Now, we're one of the smaller stations. We only have and, or 755 acres. And you see this is the original quarter that was established back in 1909. Uh, we have this land right here now. Langd is right to the bottom of the screen. And this area we've we farmed since uh, 1989 and originally was purchased a couple sessions ago. And this is land we rent here. Um, the land we do have in Langdon, there's a fair amount of saline sodic areas. So a lot of it is not uh, usable for what you call the, the premier land for some, some of the research. Um, it's great for soil health specialists that I've mentioned about a little bit. So a lot of this land gets used for some of our seed increase and we'll steal uh, better pieces within the seed increase fields. You can see up in this area here or other areas where we'll do some research um, during the growing season. Now we have really more four um, areas that we concentrate on here. And one is plant pathology, and that's uh, headed up by Dr. Vincat Chopra and research specialist Amanda. And they do, you know, done about 30 trials a year. And some of the crops they work on, you can see there, the main ones have been over the years, um, um, wheat, um, durum, canola, and soybeans, and, and sunflower. And this position was really established in the 1990s when the scab ep epidemic uh, hit. We got funding in that time for a pathology position. So a lot of work, as I mentioned, is scab. And one of the bigger ones up in our area is, uh, is club root. Um, northeast part of the state, especially on the, the county line here, we have uh, some of the most canola grown uh, in the state. And in fact, the, our county, which is Cavalier County, is called the uh, um, Canola Capital USA. We have about 250,000 acres of canola in our state, or in the, yeah, in our state. So with that comes diseases. And Ben Katz been working on black leg and white mold. But about five or six years ago, club root came into the picture. It's a disease that's soil borne, stays in the soil up to 20 years. So it's more of uh, managing it, uh, rotations, and variety selection and some other uh, soil amendments that you could apply to uh, help reduce white mold. So that's uh, one of his main focused areas. Also has looked at uh, some of the soybean work. We found sun death soybean in our county last year. And the only other place in the state was Richland County way in the south. So obviously between Richland County and Cavalier, there's more of this disease that needs to be looked at. And he's also looked at um, head rot um, with P vectoring technology. With a v, the peas will come out of their hives and go through an area where there's a type of fungicide or something. And when they go to pollinate the plants, um, they'll be carrying that fungicide too with the plants. So this are just some of the different diseases he's looked at, scab, and then the club root, which is a bigger one right now. You can see how disformed they are. Sun death syndrome, soybeans. Um, we have the black leg and the white mold. And peas are becoming a more important crop here in the northeast part of the state. Another area we're looking at is soil health, and that's um, run by Naeem Kalawar, and he's a 100% extension specialist. So some, these are some of the areas he, was, he looks at, and probably the biggest ones are soil salinity and soil sedicity, and also the excess water. So Naeem helps the, the area of farmer. He's, since 2012, he's worked with about 122 different farmers in the 14 count, county region and beyond that at times. And he's looking at the most severely unprotective areas. So when Naeem comes out and, and uh, does soil sampling, this is kind of the fields he's looking at where nothing grows. Uh, you see the salty top 
on the, <clears throat> and the sort of conditions there. So after he gets the soil uh, samples back he, and the soil results, he'll meet with a farmer and talk about how he can, uh, you know, change that land to make it more productive, whether it's just the grass or uh, if there possibly could be some tiling. And that's what he uh, talks with a producer about. Some other areas we look at, as I mentioned, we have a lot of saline sodic, and this is um, a trial that we did last year. Uh, I cooperated with him just looking at the barley and oats and some of the different salinity uh, levels. You see low on the top bar there, kind of a mid-range um, salinity in the middle. And then at the bottom, we have very high salinity and actually did get a little bit oat to grow in that area, but nothing much this year. And we're also going to uh, cooperate with you and Kai on the campus looking at some wheat early wheat or almost grass-like wheats to uh, help to um, identify some plants that may have more salt tolerance that we could uh, put into a wheat. Another area he looks at is um, I'm tiling. This is an area just on the west side of the station. It was uh, very saline for many years. Nothing grew there. He started a tiling project in 2014. And you can see how it looks now at uh, in 2018. And each year, he does take several readings in there, looking at different soil chemical properties, uh, bulk densities, water quality analysis, and also uh, groundwater depths every year. Foundation seed stocks. Um, I did mention we're the smallest station as uh, far as acres goes, with, with about 756. About 550 of those are available for um, foundation seeds. Um, Jim Sheppy and Carmen Ewert uh, man that uh, part of the program. We have about six different crops, mostly wheat and um, some different wheat varieties. And we used to have a lot of canola between our wheat varieties to, for uh, cleaning the fields up, but with club root, and we do have club root on the station, so we've had to manage that. So we've switched more to soybeans and also some of the pulse crops. We've raised some uh, peas and also some fava beans. And uh, None of the other research centers mentioned it yet, but we're certainly appreciative of the uh, lease program. We do have Case IH every year. We have an opportunity. So we get new machinery, sprayers, maybe even some uh, planting equipment every year. So I run the agronomy program and I have two research specialists that are very helpful, Lawrence Henry and Jewel Fall. She just started at the beginning of February. And <clears throat> A lot like the other research centers do, a lot of the work efforts are with, with variety testing. It's a very easy management practices that farmers can use to uh, increase their um, yields and the rest involved in uh, production management. So these are some of the crops we look at. Um, hard as spring wheat, right now field peas are kind of on the increase in our part of the world. Canola has been very important in our area of the state since the mid 1990s and soybeans has increased. And we started looking at hemp in 2015. We were the first REC to have hemp. And uh, we were glad we were close to Canada. I went up there and uh, talked to people up there who knew how to do research on hemp. So we've been working with that for the past several years. And we do work again with pre plant breeders. Um, Durham is not grown much in this area, but they have a quite big nursery here. Um, a lot of that's for uh, disease, so they can uh, weed out some of the bad varieties. We do a performance variety testing with the different companies every year. We do have off-station trials like uh, a lot of the other research centers do. And most of our off-station work deals with um, variety testing, hard red spring wheat and soybeans and some of the different environments that we have here in the Northeast. And we also do some other production work once in a while, um, looking at a fava bean study with risk management association. And some of the program is, is grant funded, um, uh, working cooperation with other research centers as well, dry beans, uh, row spacing populations. Here we have a soybean planting date and hemp this, <clears throat> with hemp we're working with the National Crop Insurance Service to develop some uh, hail studies with them so they can use in their insurance program. So we've worked with them on that for about three different years. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our, uh, our secretary. She has um, Sarah McGregor. She does a very fine job for us and, and keeps us in line. Other than that, we have about 10 full-time staff. And in the summer, we hire around 10 summer um, employees to help manage all the work that we have here. 
that's about all I have. Thank you, Brian. And our final presentation is uh, highlighting the Hedinger Research Extension Center. And I will be giving that presentation. Uh, the Hedinger Research Extension Center is located in Southwest North Dakota, about four miles from South Dakota and 80 from Montana, or about 350 miles from campus. Uh, my name is Chris Schauer, I'm the director, and I'm also one of the animal scientists here at the Hedinger Research Extension Center. When we look at the infrastructure for the HREC, uh, we were founded in 1909 on 160 acres. Right now we own about 1200 acres uh, that's contiguous right here in Hedinger. And we also rent about 3,500 acres. And some of that's in Hedinger and some of it's on state prison land in the Bismarck Mandan area. Uh, we operate about a thousand head of ewes or lambing ewes. Uh, we also run about 500 head of yearlings. So about 1500 head of mature sheep at any given time on the research center. That's the largest state owned research flock in one location. Uh, there's a couple federal flocks that are bigger, one in Du Bois, Idaho, and one in Clay Center, Nebraska. Um, we have about 80 cows here at the Heading to Research Extension Center, and I'll talk about their use a little bit. They're, they're used heavily in the wildlife program. We also manage the livestock at the ARS station in Mandan in a specific cooperative agreement. Uh, so technically, we own 110 head of cows in Mandan, as well as uh, approximately 20 head of goats, and we collaborate with them. And I really won't highlight that today. Uh, we have a 24 pen lambing barn. Uh, so from a research standpoint, uh, we've got some unique opportunities uh, to do research during lambing and before and after. Also have an outdoor 24 pen feedlot, uh, depending on the season that holds about 192 calves or 960 lambs. Uh, as Dr. Sedevic highlighted, we really do use a graduate student model, uh, especially in our wildlife range and livestock programming. Uh, we do quite a bit of undergraduate training during the summer. Uh, we have housing for around 20 students every year. It is scattered across Hedinger, but Hedinger is only a town of 1,200, uh, so it's not too far to get to, to any of it. Some of it's on the research center and some of it's in a trailer park. Uh, we annually train about five graduate students at any given time, and then during the summer also those uh, undergraduates from across the nation and some high school students. Uh, so we're usually sleeping about 20 students uh, in our housing units uh, from across the nation. Uh, as far as our conference rooms and office cap capability, we have multiple conference rooms with appropriate technology, uh, especially after COVID and CARES Act funds to integrate with campus very effectively. Being 350 miles from campus, many of our graduate students spend part of the academic year out here uh, and can integrate into the uh, taking classes on campus through the technology that we have. I am an animal scientist as well as a director. Uh, we also have a livestock extension specialist, Dr. Jana Block, uh, three farm crew and two secretaries. Our wildlife and range program is led by Dr. Ben Gomont and he has a technician. Our agronomy program is led by John Rickardson as the agronomist and he has a technician as well. And Dr. Caleb Daly uh, is our head weed scientist with a technician of Daniel Abe. So going and looking at sheep research and outreach, I don't have a formal extension appointment, uh, but I do quite a bit of sheep outreach in addition to my uh, research appointment. Outreach wise, uh, we were on one of the nation's largest shearing and wool classing schools. It's kind of the highlight of our fall in the sheep program. Uh, we also run a beginner shepherd clinic in collaboration with North Dakota lamb and wool producers and uh, the sheep extension program in Fargo and Travis Hoffman. We do quite a bit of outreach one-on-one -on -one in sheep nutrition and reproduction uh, as we don't have a formal sheep extension appointment out here. A lot of this is working with uh, larger producers or work, working with extension agents one-on-one -on, -one on sheep nutrition and reproduction questions. Uh, one of the things that we do have is uh, an OFDA or an optical fiber diameter and uh, analyzer. And this is for wool fiber analysis. And this gives us a chance to, to look at wool either from a research or from an outreach standpoint and determining the quality of that wool for that producer, whether they're making purebred selection or whether they're uh, doing their entire flock and, and just getting a handle on what their wool is. Research wise, uh, I concentrate in nutrition and reproduction and management. I've quite, done quite a bit of work with distillers grains, uh, both in females and males, looking at the effects of distillers grains on reproduction. 
Uh, we also do some research in wool and more recently we've been doing some work in animal welfare, uh, the use of analgesics during castration and docking in lambs. Uh, Dr. Jenna Block uh, provides the E for the Hedinger Research Extension Center. She is a livestock extension specialist uh, with 100% extension appointment. She works extensively with our county agents, uh, livestock producers, and also the industry organizations. I think she would tell you she spends most of her time one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, and likes to work with our agents to be able to uh, scale that her uh, workout across the entire region, if not the entire state. Her focus areas are supplementation and feed sampling and analysis, body condition scoring to monitor nutrition analysis and an understanding the relationship between animal nutrition and reproduction. She does oversee the nitrate quick test program for the state uh, where she certifies the extension uh, agents in doing nitrate quick tests for producers, especially during periods of drought or early freezes, and looking at annual forages and, and nitrate concentration and also facilitates multi-state livestock mineral supplementation education program with South Dakota and a little bit into Montana. She does do some demonstration applied research project. She's the one that would utilize the calves in that uh, feedlot during the fall. She's looked at a couple different projects, evaluating the interaction of injectable trace mineral and vaccination protocols on feed intake performance and immune response of calves, as well as looking at some winter cow feeding strategies on cow performance, offspring and carcass con uh, composition and meat quality. The Rangeland and Wildlife Program that is led by Dr. Ben Gomont uh, looks at applied research uh, at, and land use and ecological services, striving to answer questions that can improve profit for landowners while maintaining or improving the ecological services provided by the land. He utilizes both the cattle herd and the sheep flock in his program, really concentrating on wildlife habitat for both game and non-game species. Uh, more recently, getting more involved with pollinator work, in addition to owning their own hives uh, and working with some of the local uh, beekeepers, looking at honeybee production on both native and domestic, in, both native and domesticated honeybees, and also looking at grassland restoration. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see uh, utilizing controlled or prescribed fires to look at restoration of CRP grasslands. Uh, his program, as I stated earlier, works closely with scientists on campus and has a graduate student model to it and trains them for jobs in resource management and academia uh, and also provides research experience to undergraduate students. The agronomy program led by John Rickardson uh, is a class, very classical program looking at variety trials and breeding nurseries. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see uh, some of uh, the work that's been done. Um, from winter wheat and, and winter rye, spring wheat and durum wheat, all the way down to industrial hemp. Uh, he works extensively with the wheat breeding program in Fargo, uh, as well as all the breeding programs. We're doing quite a bit of wheat breeding stuff right now. Not only does he have research plots and a variety of trial plots in Hedinger, but also working with local agents in their counties with some remote plots. He also works in applied agronomy, looking at planting dates, seeding dates, seed treatments, fertilizer, fungicide, biological treatments, uh, new and alternative crops such as hemp, and rotational and system studies. Uh, 45 acres on the station is dedicated to the research plots, plus the other tracks locally if we need them. And those off-station plots are in Scranton, Regent, and Mandan. And as, as you saw in the pictures, a full complement of small plot research equipment. The weed control program led by Dr. Caleb Daly uh, concentrates on no-till crop production systems in Southwest North Dakota. Uh, the major crops that he's worked with, uh, spring wheat, canola, and sunflowers, and some minor crops with the dry peas, lentils, chickpeas, flax, safflowers, and buckwheats. Uh, as Minot alluded to, a lot of work in pre-emergent herbicides uh, has been done at the Hedinger Research Extension Center and reducing our reliance on post-emergence herbicides as well as looking at reducing early season competition from weeds. Uh, we are probably the driest part of the state, limited rainfall, and uh, that reduces the impact of pre-emergent herbicides. So fall or early spring applications may be more effective in this region. Pre-emergent herbicides may also be tank mixed uh, with post-emergent herbicides as some of the work that he's been doing. For pre-plant weed control, uh, no-till requires the use of non-selective herbicides to control emergent weeds at planting, and the timing of, of application can influence crop safety and reduce competition with the emerging crop. He's also looked at post-harvest weed control, uh, looking at the control of annual weeds such as kochia, uh, and that may reduce weed 
seed production and variability uh, with post-harvest control. And perennial weeds such as Canadian thistle, uh, looking at work after harvest, and that may impact spring planted broadleaf crops. So some unique things looked at in Southwest North Dakota based on the fact that we are so dry uh, and we have to do some spring at different time periods. So with that, this uh, slide kind of gives you a picture of our resources. The bottom left-hand corner is the 24 pen outdoor feedlot for both cattle and or sheep with graduate student and technician housing. Um, upper left-hand corner is our main office. Uh, the center is our agronomy lab where we uh, focus most of our research and especially winter work out of for both agronomy, weeds, and the range and wildlife program. Uh, bottom right hand corner is just a really good picture of our, our main facilities, uh, the director's house right there, as well as the rest of the lambing facilities. And then just to give you some context to how close we are uh, to Hedinger, we start, share a property line with uh, Hedinger both on the southern side and on our eastern side and then most of our acres. Uh, spread out to the west. Uh, we have the Hedinger Airport right here that we also rent and use for agronomy research projects.